Welcome back to all the uh, attendees and speaker presenters uh, to the second session of Eurasian Conference of um, Science, Engineering and Technological Innovation, uh, which is organized by Professor Natalia Morkun, Head Ad uh, Autom Automation in Computer Science and Technology Department, Kriviri National University, Ukraine, and Dr. C. M. Patil, Chairperson of Research Culture Society. The objective of this conference uh, is um, to promote scientific and educational activities towards the advancement of common citizens' life by improving the theory and practice of various disciplines of science and engineering. The aim of this conference is to provide the interaction stage for researchers and practitioners from academia and industry to deal with state of the art advancement and the, uh, and the respective themes. Um, the presentation session uh, will be on, sci uh, on science track. Um, the session will be chaired by Professor Irina, Associate Professor of Math, Automation, uh, Computer Science and Technology Department, CVV, National University, Ukraine. Um, the second per chairperson is uh, Dr. Neet Kamal, Associate Professor Kabispi. Um, Christ Church College, Kanpur, India. The third chairperson is Dr. Ira Upadhyay, Associate Professor of um, Amity Institute of Biotechnology, Amity University, Rajasthan, Jaipur, India. And our fourth chairperson is uh, Dr. Jessica C, Professor of Physics in, B, uh, in um, e BKNMU, Ibu. So uh, all the paper presenters uh, are given eight minutes maximum, uh, and the two minutes will be for the uh, question answer session. Um, kindly keep your um, uh, keep your PPT screen ready, and uh, we will be going uh, as uh, as um, listed out on the chart. Uh, so please try to maintain uh, the time. So good afternoon to one and all. I'm Rina Michael. The topic of my study is ameliorative effect of an anamoric leaf extract on fipronil induced biochemical and histological changes in Oreochromis mesambicus. The aim of my study is to evaluate the role of the enzymes SOD, GP, SCAT in protecting the cell against the potentially toxic effects of fipronil in Oreochromis mesambicus to investigate the ameliorating effect of an anamoric leaf extract on these enzymes when exposed to toxicity of fipronil in Oreochromis mosambicus, and also to assess the degree of histopathological alterations in the gills and kidney on exposure to sublethal concentrations of fipronil feeding in fish with normal food and with plant extract. Coming to materials and methods, fipronil is a pesticide used in this study, and the UPAC name of fipronil is the 5 amino 126 dichlorophor trifluoromethyl phenyl, 4 trifluoromethyl sulfonyl, and 1 hydrogen pyrosol 3 carbon nitrile. It is used as an as an insecticide and is a vinyl pyrosol. It is applied as an insecticide, termicide, and formicide. The wide distribution, extraordinary hardy nature, high stocking density, easy to reproduce, omnivorous nature, and adaptability to artificial diet have all contributed considering Oreochromis mosambicus as an experimental animal for this toxicity study. Anonymericata is a plant extract used in this study, and Anonymericata is belong to the family Anonaceae, also known as Sorsop. Its herbal extracts are cheaper, non-toxic, and environmentally and ecologically safe. And uh, it is a rich source of various phytochemicals like flavonoids, terpenoids, steroids, saponins, and cardiac glycosides. These phytochemicals are attributed with the free radical scavenging, which is a key mechanism in various diseases, and this property, when used as an Ameliorating activity renders protective adaptations in various organisms exposed to toxicity linked to oxidative stress. Coming to experimental setup, fishes were grouped into two units, consists of a control and exposed to three sublethal concentration of fipronil, which was fed with normal feed, and unit two, which, which was fed with an unamericated plant extract supplement. The fishes were collected on day 15 and day 13 of experiment for biochemical and histological analysis. 
Coming to biological, biochemical analysis, superoxide dismutase was estimated by das et al. method and catalase was estimated by the method of Sinha et al. GPX was calculated by the method of Rotrek et al. The following were the methods which was used for the histological analysis. The dissected fishes, uh, the kidneys and gills were taken and it, it was followed through different processes like fixation, dehydration, clearing of tissues, called infiltration, embedding, block making, decalcification, section cutting, staining with hematosaline and eosin. Coming to the results, this is a graph which shows the activity of superoxide dismutase in kidney and gills. And here it shows the catalase activity in kidney and gills. And this is the GPS activity in kidney and gills. So SOD cat and GPS activity in kidney and gills of fipronil treated fishes showed a significant reduction in all the concentrations. The fishes which was fed with plant extract showed a significant reduction, but its level was higher when compared to fishes fed with normal feed in all the levels of enzymes. Coming to histologic studies, these are the four images taken from the fishes which was kept as control. The following images show fish exposed to fipronil at various concentrations. Here we can see the gills, sections of gills, which was uh, uh, the sections of gill parenchyma, hyperplasia of gill epithelium, curling of secondary gill lamellae, and with mild sloughing and lymphocyte inflammation can be seen in this photograph. Here the sections of gill shows gill parenchyma with mild sloughing, epithelial uplifting of secondary gill lamellae, and lymphocytic inflammation. Here, the section of gill parenchyma shows with patchy epithelial hyperplasia, curling of secondary gill lamellae, and basal fusion. The subepithelial vessels show congestion of peri and perivascular lymphocytic inflammation. Here, the section of gill parenchyma with patchy epithelial hyperplasia, telangiectasia, lamellar disorganization, and basal fusion. The subepithelial vessels show congestion and perivascular lymphocytic inflammation. Here, we can see the gill parenchyma with mild sloughing lamellar disorganization. Epithelial uplifting of secondary gill lamellae and lymphocytic inflammation. Here we, we could see that the gills with the lamellar capillary congestion, telangiectasia, curling of secondary gill lamellae, and diffuse chronic inflammation. This image shows the gill with gill uh, parenchyma with the mild sloughing hyperplasia of gill epithelium, lamellar disorganization, and lymphocytic inflammation. Here we can see the gill parenchyma with the mild sloughing and lymphocytic inflammation. In this image, we could see that the section of gill parenchyma with the patchy epithelial hyperplasia and basal fusion. Subepithelial vessels show congestion and perivascular lymphocytic inflammation. Here, the section of gill parenchyma with the patchy epithelial hyperplasia and basal fusion. The subepithelial vessels show congestion and perivascular lymphocytic inflammation. Here, we can see the section of gill with lamellar capillary congestion with the diffuse moderate chronic inflammation. Here we could see that section of gill with lamellar capillary congestion with diffuse moderate chronic inflammation. These are the images of kidney taken from the fishes which was kept as control. The following images show fish exposed to fipronil at various concentrations. Here we could see the renal parenchyma with the moderate acute on chronic interstitial inflammation along with a few dilated Bowman's capsule. Here we could see that renal parenchyma with the moderate acute or chronic interstitial inflammation along with several dilated permanent capsules progressive glomerular sclerosis. In this picture, we can see that renal parenchyma with the mild chronic inflammation, dilated Bowman's capsule, mild patchy glomerular sclerosis. Sections of renal parenchyma with the mild chronic inflammation, lymphocyte infiltration, dilated Bowman's capsule, necrosis, increased glomerular sclerosis. In this picture, we could see that the sections of renal parenchyma diffuse mild chronic interstitial inflammation, dilated Bowman's capsule, and glomerular sclerosis. Here we can see the sections of renal parenchyma with the diffuse mild chronic interstitial inflammation and glomerular sclerosis and degeneration. In here, we could see the sections of renal parenchyma with the mild acute on chronic interstitial inflammation along the few dilated Bowman's capsule. In this image, we can see that renal parenchyma with mild chronic interstitial inflammation along with a few dilated Bowman's capsule and glomerular sclerosis. This image shows the sections of renal parenchyma with mild inflammation, dilated Bowman's capsule, mild patchy glomerular sclerosis, and regenerative cells. 
Here we can see that renal parenchyma with mild chronic inflammation, dilated Wormann's capsule, mild patchy glomerular sclerosis. In this picture, we can see that the renal parenchyma with the diffuse mild chronic interstitial inflammation and glomerular sclerosis. This image shows the renal parenchyma with the diffuse mild chronic interstitial inflammation and glomerular sclerosis. Coming to conclusion, the protective effect of an adamuricated leaf extract against fipronil toxicity is well evidenced by the increased activity of SOD, CAT, and GPX XA enzymes. Results indicated that the supplement with anodomuricated leaf extract mitigated fipronil induced oxidative damage. Histological examination of kidney and gill provide information on the toxicity of fipronil and the effect of the plant extract of anodomuricata on the toxicity of fipronil. It also shows the immunostimulant activity of anonymericata leaf extract that exhibited the toxic effects on the cellular level of organism. The effect of fipronil, although detrimental to fish, is prevented to some extent with supplementing plant extract-based food. Most of the cellular changes observed clearly indicate the toxicity of fipronil, and these subliteral alterations are indications of adaptive responses of fish against pollutants. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for your uh, impactful presentation. Uh, Chairpersons, uh, you can ask the presenter uh, your queries and questions. Yes, uh, can you explain me the immunostimulant effect in detail? Pardon me, ma'am. Can you explain me the immunostimulant meaning of immunostimulant effect in detail? Can you hear me? Uh, it's, no, no, it's vague actually. I could, I am not getting. Can you explain me the meaning of immunostimulant effect? You have mentioned it in the in your last slide. Can you explain me that? What do you exactly mean by immunostimulant effect? The anonymity has got different uh, um, phytochemicals present in uh, uh, plant extract, and th they act as a uh, and they reduce the activity of uh, uh, this pesticide in them, and uh, they reduce toxicity, which was affected uh, the organisms. That is the fish. Okay, fine. Is there any other way out also? Like, uh, can, we, uh, can we provide some other uh, derivatives so that in order to control this? Uh, my, my main focus on this uh, part only, ma'am, I am on the process of investigating. So you have not tried with other species? Uh, only in this species I have tried. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think you should go uh, some few species of this family and then you can correlate the effect that would be a better data that you are going to get. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. I'll do that. Yeah. Fine. Go ahead. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. I am Ms. Noemi Busumatari, a PhD scholar in the Department of Biotechnology, Monolan University, Assam, India. The title of my presentation is A Study on Acceptability of Genetic Counseling Intervention for hereditary hemoglobin disorders among adolescents of Northeast India. So hemoglobinopathies are a group of hereditary diseases which are characterized by abnormal, uh, abnormal production of hemoglobin. And these disorders exhibit autosomal recessive pattern of inheritance. Uh, these disorders can be categorized into uh, two categories. One are, are carriers and the others are disease cases. In case of carriers, uh, you me, I think your, uh, I think your your screen your slides are not moving. Please check. Uh, is it in the intro disorders? Can be categorized into two categories. One is uh, carriers and the others disease cases. In case of carriers, only one allele of uh, one allele of the gene is affected or mutated, and as a result. They, uh, they do not show the diseases, but act as carriers. 
and in case of the disease cases, uh, both the alleles are mutated and as a result, the disease is expressed. Uh, your slides are not moving. I think it's not the first Come slide. Come on the second there. slide. Come on the second slide. Shusheta Mawalanovich and I'm a scholar of the Division of Molecular Medicine, Bose Institute, Kolkata. <clears throat> the uh, objective of my study is the suppression of the ear stress and the mitochondria mediated NLRP3 inflammasome formation in the COPD mice by melatonin. We know that the COPD is an inflammatory disorder where there is a restricted airflow due to the excessive airway remodeling. And it is the third leading cause of our worldwide death. Cigarette smoke is the main causative factors of this kind of COPD development. <clears throat> Here in this study, I have developed the COPD mice model by using 3R, 4F Kentucky research grade cigarettes. And uh, I exposed the Swiss albino mice for four hours per day, up to four weeks for the COPD development. And I use melatonin as a protective. Melatonin is a hormone that is secreted by our pineal gland, and it has antioxidant as well as anti-inflammatory property over, uh, and also known, it also regulates the circadian rhythm of our body. So uh, in the melatonin plus COPD group, I use 10 mg per kg melatonin uh, via interperitoneal in injection through the in the before the CS exposure and for the in vitro study I use the L132 cell line basically and here the uh, after and use the cigarette smoke uh, extract and after determining the concentration I LC50 to LC50 value of the cigarette smoke concentration it was near about the 10 percent of this uh, for concentration. Then I use 40 microliter of the melatonin pretreatment and CSA extract treatment, that is the 10%. And I found that there is an elevated level of the lactate dehydrogenase, as well as there is a huge death of the L132 uh, cells due to the cigarette smoke exposure. And when the HA staining was done from the lung of the cigarette smoke mice, there is a huge disruption of the alveolar structure. And that lead to the development of the indicate, there is a development of the emphysema in the cigarette smoke exposed mice. Melatonin uh, pretreatment can help to restore the lung arch architecture. Next, <clears throat> next I measure various inflammatory parameters where I can I found that there is an upregulation of the reactive oxygen species due to the ROS production uh, due to the cigarette smoke exposure, and there is a damage of the mem membrane lipid. More also the level of various antioxidant enzyme that is the superoxid dismutase catalase and level of the reduced glutathione is, re uh, is decreased where, where the level in cigarette smoke mice where the level of the uh, 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 oxidized glutathione is increased. Melatonin intake, melatonin intake in, uh, can help to restore all of these parameters. Moreover, there is a upregulated uh, LDH level and the total protein content in the bronchoalveolar lavage fluid indicate that there is a disruption of the alveolar cells, uh, alveolar cell due to the cigarette toxicity. There is an increased number of inflammatory cells like the neutrophils, macrophage, as, uh, as well as there is an increased uh, level of the myeloparoxygase activity that indicate that neutrophil um, uh, uh, infiltration occurred. Now, <clears throat> I have checked the parameters in the bronchoalveolar uh, fluid, some parameters, and found that the level of the TNF alpha, IL1 beta, and IL18 is increased. When I have uh, this indicate an IL1 beta and IL18 is associated with the inflammasome. Therefore, I check the marker of the inflammasomes. Here I found that there is an upregulated expression of the NLRP3 in the cigarette smoke mice. When the level of NLRP3 is upregulated, that caused the activation of the caspase 1, and caspase 1 ultimately lead to the activation of the IL1 beta that lead to the pyroptotic cell death. Here, by doing the immunofluorescent study, I found that there is an upregulated expression of the NLRP3 into the cigarette smoke mice as well as L132 cell that indicate that cigarette smoke caused the inflammation formation, inflammasome formation. 
and two of the factors that is uh, linked to the inflamed organelles that is associated with the inflammasome formation is the endoretic endoplasmic reticulum and mitochondria therefore i checked the mitochondria I mean, endoplasmic reticulum marker and found there is a Updated mRNA of the GRP7 chain chop that indicate there is an onset of stress, and therefore I checked the various parameters where I found that there is an upregulated production of various ES sensors like the GRP71, IRE1 alpha, PERC, all of the and the I, eu eukaryotic initiating factor 2 alpha. All of this factor caused the uh, cause the upregulation of the chop and that ultimately triggered the upregulation of the TX nip. In the normal condition, the TX nip is associated with the uh, TRX1 that is actually act as an antioxidant protein. But during the stress, when TX nip is disassociated from the TRX1, it can bind to the uh, leucine rich region of this NLRP2 and trigger the NLRP3 in a chromosome formation that indicate that upregulated TX nip expression due to the ER stress caused the um, NLRP3 formation. Moreover, there is an upregulated expression of the colpin 1. When there is an upregulated colpin 1 expression, that indicates there is the increased level of the calcium inside the reticulum. Next, I check the mitochondrial may help where I found there is an upregulated uh, mitochondrial membrane potential is disrupted due to the cigarette smoke exposure and there is a decreased ATP production as well as there is an increased mitochondrial swelling. Mitochondrial swelling occur when there is an opening of the mitochondrial permeability transition pore and there is a factor that is the one is one of the component of this MPK pure mitochondrial permission pore is the VDAC1. So there is an upregulated VDAC1 so that therefore it indicates the calcium from endoplasmic reticulum entered the mitochondria via the MPQP. And there is an upregulated production of the mitochondrial ROS in both uh, cigarette smoke exposed tissue as well as LE132 cell. Now, to indicate, to check whether the cigarette smoke is the main culprit for this NLRP3 expression, I did the inhibitor study where I used the NAC that acts as an antioxidant. And when I use this CAC melatonin along with NAC, there is a reduced production of TX nip as well as mitochondrial loss. All of them, ultimately, there is a reduced expression of the NLRP3. Next, I check how melatonin help to the, give the protection. It basically helps to up, um, restore the various antioxidant enzymes that like the NRF2. And when there is the activation of NRF2, it causes the upregulation of the various antioxidant enzymes like TRX1, SORT, CAT, uh, SORT HO1, etc. Moreover, melatonin induces the process of mitophagy, and mitophagy helps to remove this damaged mitochondria and reduce the mitochondrial ROS overproduction by upregulating the markers of mitophagy like PINK1, PARKING, LCP3B. Etc. Here I can find the co-localization through the co-localization study. I found that there is a um, in melatonin treated cell, there is an upregulated expression of the LC3B as well as mitoros. Um, when I co-localize that indicate that there is a mitophagy occur in these cases. So here I can conclude that cigarette smoke produce excessive ROS that cause the ER stress and ER stress lead to the TX nip upregulation that cause the NLRP3 formation. At the same time, due to the ear stress, there is an elevated level of calcium. That calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum go to the mitochondria via the mitochondrial permeability transition pore, and this lead to the upregulation of the mitochondrial ROS. And mitochondrial ROS also has a role into the NLRP3 inflammasome formation. In melatonin, on the other hand, inhibits the TX nip production by upregulating TRX1 antioxidant expression, as well as it promotes the pink one park in mitophagy to remove the disturbed mitochondria and therefore inhibit the onset of the inflammation. So melatonin restored the cellular antioxidant status and inhibited inflammasome formation by suppressing the ear stress and mitophagic machinery impairment. Thank you. That was so, an operative graphical poster presentation, ma'am. Thank you. The uh, chairperson yes, can uh, ask any of the queries and questions now. Yes, Sushmita, you have very well presented your this poster presentation. I have a query. Like, what yes, is the uh, like? You are talking about melatonin. Yes, fine. Yes. So, uh, what effect does it causes on the human 
for this. Actually, in normally uh, human body, we have a melatonin. It helps to our re re regulate our circadian rhythm. Basically, the awake and the sleep cycle is mainly controlled by the uh, melatonin. When there is any disruption of the melatonin level, the uh, sleep awake cycle is disrupted. Moreover, it has very antioxidant, antioxidant, and as a as and also an anti-inflammatory molecule. Now, it is basically in our body synthesized by the pineal gland. But uh, I think it's a sleep hormone also. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma it is a, yes, yes. That's why it is control our circadian rhythm. Means sleep and wake cycle, basically. It control. When we are going to sleep, that time the melatonin in our body, inside our body, built up. So that that's time we feel sleepy due to the presence of melatonin. And the so secretion what? of melatonin also linked with the light. In the presence of the light, uh, the melatonin secretion is, uh, is disrupted. So in the presence of light, most of the time we do not feel sleepy. When the light of the melatonin uh, secretion is uh, stimulated and we feel sleepy. So you have correlated this melatonin. Uh, you can say, you, you say that we can induce melatonin uh, while smoking. Like those who are smoking, we can give this melatonin. Supplements yes, and yes, we can and we can reduce the inflammation that is caused by uh, yes, COPD. The inflammation that is caused due to slope COPD. COPD, fine. Mm -hmm. So, till what extent, uh, till what uh, doses the melatonin can be given? It is 10 mg per kg body weight for the Swiss albino mice model. And what should be the duration? Duration is uh, I, I did one hour before the COPD uh, cigarette smoke exposure. One hour, and I performed the experiment after the evening period. No, is it During safe? Like, because uh, chain smokers they smoke a lot, and uh, so is it safe to give this? Yes, ma'am. Melatonin has no side effect because it is produced inside your body. It is uh, okay. body also. It's, it's it's a biomolecule that is already pro in vivo bi biomolecule. It's produced inside your body, so there is no side effect actually. Melatonin. So you can, uh, you can, uh, even when I uh, perform this experiment in vitro, ma'am, here you can see, when I perform this experiment in vitro, I goes up to 400, uh, 500 micromolar concentration. And I do not found any cell cytotoxicity at this high level of concentration. But I chose, uh, the, at first initial screening, I chose 0 to 500 micromolar and 500 micromolar, but I do not found any toxicity, but I choose the optimum toxicity, optimum level that is 40 micromolar. But up to 500 micromolar, it does not exert any kind of toxicity in the alveolar epithelial cell. And it is a human alveolar epithelial cell, basically. Okay, fine, fine. Fine, the presentation was very good. And I think instead of poster presentation, you should yes, have gone for a paper presentation in this because you have done a lot of work on it. Ma'am, it is actually a published paper. I published in uh, last year, it is. Okay, it's a published paper. In which journal is it published? It is uh, Food and Chemical Toxicology, ma'am. It is 6.5. Um, Isa. Good morning, everyone. I'm Isa Umar Usman from Federal Polytechnic, uh, Nigeria, Biological Science Department. I'm here to present a paper title Enlightening the Future on the Effect of Zoonotic Diseases and Ways to Mitigate and Combat Them. Abstract. Zoonotic diseases or zoonosis are diseases shared between animals, including livestock, wildlife, pets, and human beings. Zoonotic diseases are commonly spread at the human-animal environmental interface, where people and animals interact with each other in their shared environment. Zoonotic diseases can be foodborne, waterborne, vector-borne, or transmitted through direct contact with animals, or indirectly by fomites or environmental contamination. They can pose serious risk to both animals and human health, and may have far-reaching impacts on economies and livelihoods, agriculture, and environmental integrity. As every day we hear about health challenges at the human-animal-environmental interface, Zoonotic diseases such as avian influenza, rabies, Ebola, or Rift Valley fever, as well as foodborne diseases and antimicrobial resistance continue to have major impacts on health and livelihoods and economies. Around 60% of all infectious diseases in humans are zoonotic, 
and about 75% of all imagined to be infectious diseases. On average, one new infectious disease emerges in human every four months. While many originate in wildlife, livestock often reserve as an epidemiological bridge between wildlife and human infections. Introduction. Zoonotic diseases are defined as diseases originating from animals or a human acquired infectious, infectious diseases from zoonotic reservoir, either naturally or through zoonotic vectors. They can also be contagious or non-contagious infections with imaging or emerging characteristics and naturally transmissible from vertebrate animals to humans and vice versa via contact, food, water, and by vectors in human and animal ecosystem. Objectives of carrying out this research. The principal aim of carrying out this research include, but not only limited to the following objectives. Number one, to enlighten people, especially rural dwellers, on the effect of zoonotic diseases. Number two, enable them to know zoonotic diseases types, to know the causative agents of zoonotic diseases, most transmitted zoonotic diseases, and general mitigate and combat zoonotic Research questions. By tracing zoonotic disease effects, the following important questions could be asked. Number one, specifically, who are the high risk individuals to contact zoonotic diseases? What are the types of zoonotic diseases? How are the zoonotic diseases transmitted? What to do if you have zoonotic disease? What are the possible ways to combat zoonotic diseases? Methodology. Content analysis was used as the methodology of this research to review literature of some other authors in the field of zoonotic diseases. We searched for published articles on zoonotic diseases, including those to, used to be present in the world. The search terms include what include, but not limited to the following. Number one, what are the types of zoonotic diseases? How are zoonotic diseases transmitted? What to do if you have zoonotic diseases? What are the possible ways to combat zoonotic diseases? And lastly, reference in the identified articles were reviewed to draw conclusion. Findings and discussions. Zoonotic diseases are major public health issues in several countries of the world. And Africa is among the top geographical hotspots for such diseases. Zoonotic disease classification with the advanced laboratory techniques and increased awareness among medical and veterinary scientists, ecologists, and biologists. More than 300 zoonoses of diverse etiology are now recognized. These are classified as follow. Number one, according, they are classified according to their etiological agents. Under this, we have bacterial zoonoses, rickettsial zoonoses, protozoal zoonosis, helminthic zoonosis, fungal zoonosis. Uh, number two, according to the mode of transmission, under this we have direct zoonosis, cyclozoonosis, metazoonosis, saprozoonosis. According to the reservoir host, we also have anthropozoonosis, zooanthropozoonosis, amphizoonosis. Zoonotic disease agents and types. Based on the causative agents, the following zoonotic agents were retained fungus, parasites, zoonotic disease spread by arthropods. How are zoonotic diseases transmitted? Zoonos zoonosis can be transmitted in various ways. Example, we have through the air by eating contaminated uh, meat or produce, through close contact with an infected animal, by touching an area or surface that an infected animal touched, through insect bites like mosquito or ticks, through hiking bike, boats, or other activities in the great outdoors, petting animals, those lived, who, those who live nearby animals, and walking on farms. What to do if you have zoonotic disease? If you have or think you have zoonotic disease, you should contact a medical professional as soon as possible. If you are scratched or biting by an animal, be sure to have an animal thoroughly checked by a veterinarian. 
This is to make sure that they are appropriately vaccinated and don't have rabies or other zoonotic diseases. If you have been biting by a tick or try to preserve the tick after removal in a safe container, this way it, might, it, may, it can be identified to narrow down the possible diseases that it might transmit and test it for any of those diseases. Who are the high risk individuals of these nautic diseases? We have some people as follow. Number one, pregnant women, adult age 65 or older, children five years old or younger, those with HIV, those with cancer who are going through chemotherapy, others with weakened immune system. Possible ways to mitigate and combat zoonotic diseases. Zoonotic diseases are commonly everywhere in the world. Therefore, there is need for extra care. The following simple steps could help to mitigate and combat their occurrences. We have number one, creating food safety regulations. Number two, washing hands diligently, use of insect repellents or other methods to keep mosquitoes, fleas, and ticks away. Practice safe food handling like washing of all produce before eating it. Avoiding, avoid being bitten or scratched by an animal. Have your pets vaccinated and take them for regular annual visit to the veterinarian. Talk to your veterinarian about appropriate flea and tick preventives for your pets. Check for ticks when you have been outside. Don't eat, drink, or touch your eyes or mouth while you are handling or in close contact with animals. Use of gloves if you need to handle an animal that is or appears to be sick. Keep any areas where animals are kept clean and sanitary. Be aware of areas where animals or insects might be. When you are Participants like hunting and care contact multiple overload. Lastly, conclusion. In conclusion, the seriousness and outlook of zoonotic diseases vary depending on the type of disease you have. Many are treatable, while others can cause serious long-term and even lifelong and fatal conditions. So it is important that you check with your doctor or medical professional as soon as you think you might have a zoonotic disease. It is also an important reason to practice prevention around any animal, wild or domestic. Thank you for listening. That was a very informative presentation. Uh, the chairpersons can ask their questions to the presenter. Yes, Isa, uh, you gave a very good uh, overview regarding the zoonotic diseases. Compiling of yes, each and everything. Yeah. It was a Thank good you, review ma. that the, uh, the literature that you all uh, made it cashed up in a single paper regarding the causes, preventions, and everything. Okay, what do you tell? What do you say about corona? Uh, corona is also zoonotic disease anticipated to be originated from uh, bats. Some people speculated that it originated from bats, not bats. And it originated from China. Yeah. Later on, it became endemic worldwide. Hmm. So any, uh, something very special, like you have told the preventions and everything, would you like to tell us something about Corona? How could yes. we, Cor or, 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 or are those uh, precautions that we have been using regarding Corona, wearing mask and everything. Is something special have you tried to search out? Yeah. Yes, uh, Corona happens to be a zoonotic disease as anticipated by scientists. So the same procedures needs to be uh, followed to combat and prevent uh, spreading of this Corona disease. Like for instance, wherever we are going, we need to be washing our hands. We should be taking care of a very close contact with uh, people. And also we should be very careful of uh, intermingling with animals also. In your country. Um, 
Good afternoon, everyone present here. Uh, I'm Trisha Sunwal. Uh, I'm a research scholar from Borderland University, Department of Biotechnology, um, Assam, India. So before uh, starting uh, with my uh, presentation, I would like to say a few facts about thyroid disorder. Nowadays, thyroid disorder is a common problem. Uh, so if, um, and if you ask any family, there will be at least one or two with thyroid disorder. And it is getting common because of many reasons, reasons such as uh, stress, uh, increased use of endocrine disruptors. Um, to put it simple, endocrine disruptors are the problems that are associated with environment which cause endocrine problems. And uh, one of its such problem is the use of plastics. And the main uh, types of thyroid disease are hypothyroid and hyperthyroid. Hypothyroid is the uh, uh, hypothyroid is a disease where the thyroid gland does not produce enough thyroid hormones like thyroxine. And hypothyroid is the overproduction of the thyroid hormones. In hypothyroid and hyperthyroid, there are different um, clinical features such as subclinical hyperthyroid or hypothyroid, overt hyper or hypothyroid, secondary hypo or hypothyroid. So our study site was uh, that we selected is the Mahasau, um, which is it's situated in the northeastern states of Assam and it is surrounded uh, by the neighboring states such as Meghalaya, Manipur, Nagaland, and uh, its neighboring countries are like Bangladesh, Myanmar, Bhutan. Uh, my objective is to determine the prevalence of thyroid function alterations in a healthcare center and the distribution according to sex and age. Methodology. Um, the study was approved by Institutional Ethics Committee of Borland University and also the consent letter was obtained from the patients uh, that are included in the study. So firstly, the study was conducted in Omrangsu CHC um, hospital uh, and uh, the study duration was from April 2020 to March 2021. Total of 990 individuals were screened for thyroid profiling. Then we collected uh, uh, intravenous blood samples of about 3 ml and then the samples were kept, kept in room temperature and they were allowed to clot. After collection, the serum was separated after uh, separated by centrifugation. Then after centrifugation, the blood samples were, uh, were uh, sent for thyroid profiling and uh, we did a test for T3, T4 and TSH. The serum that were separated were labeled properly and were stored at minus 20 degrees uh, Celsius for further analysis. And we also recorded the patient informations, which included the name, sex, uh, date of test. And after um, the collection uh, and after analyzing of the report, uh, we went for statistical analysis uh, uh, that were done using SPSS. So in table one, um, here it's uh, shown the distribution of the study population according to the age and gender. Here we can see, uh, here's, here as we can see, uh, the female population are mostly affected with thyroid disease. That means the prevalence of thyroid disease is more common in female than male. And here the, in this age group, we can see the reproductive age group that is 30 to 41 uh, of years, they are um, mostly affected with this thyroid disorders. In table two, the prevalence of different types of hypothyroid and hypothyroid according to sex are shown. These are the different types of the thyroid, overt hypothyroid, then secondary hyperhypothyroid, subclinical hyper or hypothyroid. Uh, from this table, we can see that the uh, hypothyroidism is more common than hypothyroidism. And among uh, this hypothyroidism, subclinical is the most common type of hypothyroidism then overt hypothyroidism and the least common uh, hypothyroidism is the secondary hypothyroidism. So in this present study, 
18.5% uh, of the total patients have different types of thyroid disorders. Uh, and the prevalence of female was seen in 16.2% and that of male was 2.3%. The maximum and minimum prevalence was seen in the age group of 31 to 40 years, that is 49.81%. I'm not going to respectively. Elevated THS was seen, uh, was common among the elderly population from 61 to 70, 70 years. The percentage of hypothyroid, uh, that is 14.6% in this study, is higher than the hyperthyroid. And the elevation of serum T3, T4, and TSH they categorize the thyroid disorders into uh, different clinical types of thyroids, that is subclinical, overt, secondary, hypothyroid, and hypothyroid. Then the prevalence of subclinical hypothyroid is more common than overt and secondary hypothyroid, which affected 15.2% of the total subjects, where women were mostly affected than men. Our study also showed more dominance of subclinical hypothyroid of 15.2% than overt hypothyroidism, secondary or central thyroidism, uh, thyroidism being the rarest among the population. Then the prevalence of subclinical hypothyroidism was 13.35% and 6.49% of overhypothyroidism. Uh, from this study, we can conclude that the prevalence of thyroid is more common among women than men and increases along with age. Then the rate of hypothyroid is higher than hypothyroid among thyroidism, subclinical thyroid is more common. Even though over thyroidism uh, cases are smaller in number, but they need an emergent study as the case leads to thyroid carcinoma. The prevalence of thyroid disorder is difficult to compare across countries due to differences in diagnostic thresholds, assay-sensitive population selection, and iodine intake. Untreated thyroidism leads to adverse clinical complications for patients. Hence, study on the epidemiological feature of thyroid dysfunction is necessary to plan for effective interventions. Therefore, a universal treat strategy should be executed for every age group in treating thyroid disorders, considering the race or stock of a population. Thank you. Uh, the title of my presentation is A Study on Acceptability of Genetic Counseling Intervention for Hereditary Hemoglobin Disorders Among Adolescents of Northeast India. So hemoglobinopathies are a group of uh, genetic disorders of hemoglobin which are characterized by abnormalities in the production of hemoglobin. And these disorders saw autosomal recessive pattern of inheritance. And hemoglobinopathies can be categorized into two categories. One is the risk, uh, one is carriers and the other's disease. In case of the carriers, only one allele of the uh, gene is mutated and hence they do not show the disease, but they act as carriers. And in case of the diseased uh, patients, both the alleles of the gene are uh, mutated and as a result, the uh, disease is expressed. And uh, according to uh, the World Health Organization report of 2008, 5.2% of the world's uh, total population are carriers of hemoglobinopathy. And among the hemoglobinopathies, sickle cell disease and beta thalassemia, they require a lifelong blood transfusion. As a result, these two, uh, these two diseases are to be taken into consideration. A certain advanced interventions are developed for improving the uh, management of these patients, but these intervention strategies are uh, very costly and they also require strict observance. Therefore, a low cost but effective strategy should be developed for management of these patients. And as a low-cost uh, effective strategy, carrier screening followed by genetic counseling can be adopted. This will help to identify the couples at risk and then educate them regarding the risk associated with these uh, disorders. And many countries of the Mediterranean regions and other small countries have also started or adopted carrier screening programs and followed by genetic counseling and they have some successful results. In India, hemoglobinopathies and thalassemia have turned into a major health concern, which should be uh, taken into consideration. An ongoing multicentric study from India has reported that 7.74% of the total population of rural India are, car are carriers of sickle cell uh, disorders. 
Thus, our present work was framed and carried out to understand the load of hemoglobin disorder carriers among the adolescents of Assam, Northeast India, and also to understand the acceptability of genetic counseling intervention program uh, among this population. So for this study, we have selected, uh, we have randomly selected seven districts of Assam of Northeast India. These districts were Kokrajar, Sirang, Baksa, Odalguri, Dimahasau, Karbiyanglong, and Dhemaji. And here in this map, uh, the districts from which we have collected the samples are shown. For this study, we first conducted a house-to-house -house visit for collection of blood samples. And before collection of blood samples, we uh, obtained consent from the subjects or their families. And we considered both uh, adolescents of uh, both male and, male and female belonging to the age group 10 to 19 years. And following blood uh, sample collection, we, conduct, uh, we conducted complete blood count analysis and hemoglobin typing. Complete blood count was done to study the comp complete uh, blood profile of the subject and hemoglobin typing was done to uh, identify the hemoglobin variant. Then we also conducted interviews with the patients and their families to know if they were ready to accept genetic counseling if they were provided. So these are some of the pictures taken for uh, during blood collection. And here in this table, we have shown the hemoglobinopathies which were detected in our study. Uh, for this study, we, uh, we categorized the whole population group into three, uh, three groups based on their ethnicity. One is Mongoloid, the other proto australoid and then the Aryans. And then in this study, we found that hemoglobin S and hemoglobin E were the major hemoglobin variants. And hemoglobin E was uh, prevalent among the Mongoloids and the Aryan population, and hemoglobin S was prevalent among the proto australoid population. And in the whole population, 10.7% were carriers of hemoglobin disorders. Among these, 20.2% were sickle cell carriers, and the rest were, uh, that is 76.06% were HBE carriers. And we also detected uh, cases of beta thalassemia and double heterozygosity for hemoglobin S and hemoglobin E. And from the interview, we can, uh, can, we, uh, we can see that 70.5% of the uh, subjects where they agreed for uh, genetic counseling intervention program if they are provided free of cost by certified genetic counselors. Then 12.2% responded as to not, they, uh, don't know, and 17.3% uh, respond, responded not to accept because of some religious and uh, social uh, fears. The screening, uh, so for further, uh, uh, to prevent further transmission of the hemoglobin of it is, screening for carriers in the adolescent age group is the most appropriate way. Many countries of the Mediterranean, Mediterranean region, they have already adopted such control programs and have been successful. This type of screening programs will serve as a uh, platform for increasing awareness and education among the population. Then another advantage of this type of screening is that asymptomatic carriers of uh, recessively inherited disorders will also be identified. Uh, this type of uh, population screening programs, uh, along with prenatal diagnosis, has been successful in some small countries. Uh, these are some of the examples in which uh, such uh, screening programs have proven to be successful. In Sardinia, uh, reduction has been seen in thalassemic disease cases from 1 is to 250 to 1 is to 4,000 births following a screening program and prenatal diabetes. Again, in Iran and Turkey, also thalassemic births were reduced following premarital screening. And in Menorca, also a beta thalassemia carrier screening program had some successful results. And in Canada, uh, after a voluntary carrier screening program for high school students, the beta thalassemia cases were also reduced. And in case of India, although, the, uh, although HPS or hemoglobin S carriers are high, such national screening programs are not yet implemented. Therefore, uh, so considering the uh, legal age for marriage in India, which is 18 years for female and 21 years for male, we can uh, adopt carrier screening program among this premarital age group. This type of intervention method will help in gradual elimination of the genetic disease from this council population. Thus, based on the responses received from the interview, with the patients and their families, we can conclude that carrier screening followed by genetic counseling services can be adopted as a uh, intervention by government as well as private health service provider to completely eradicate uh, this, uh, these diseases in the region. Thank you.
that was indeed an exceptional study and presentation uh, oh, thank you um uh, uh, persons can ask their questions to the presenter now yeah uh, why don't you try a field survey on it in india like you are saying that no, such programs are not going on so why don't you go for this studies also and why don't you start with the initiation of such programs so that we can also have a better rate of hemoglobin in our country uh, ma'am we have uh, started screening programs here in our region no screening programs are practical based or or are they only uh, lecture or webinar based no no it's uh, practically ma'am practically so how yes. what survey did, uh, what data did you got uh, we have studied their hemoglobin content and Fine. also their uh, hemoglobin variant and we are still going on with this study ma'am no after that studying the hemoglobin variant and what the after that we will uh, provide some counseling to those patients so is it successful it's not or you have not, no, you have this not provided is not yet them. done ma'am counseling is not yet done ma because see theoretical data is fine but i think the requirement of the r is now to do the counseling session and how much our study can help the mankind that should be brought into much more like vitality instead of providing all this data so i think for the next paper you can make a like a data chart or in a tabular okay. form you can okay. make and that and that would be very helpful for you okay. not only on your uh, like uh, this research platform but it will really help you to do some uh, some work uh, first okay all right so firstly i would like to thank uh, the organizers and co-sponsors including uh, research cultural society and scientific research association and kiev national university along with uh, eurasia university and institute of science and technology for uh, providing me an opportunity uh, to present uh, this critical review so as far as uh, uh, the title of the paper is concerned it is critical review of mixed reality integration with medical device for patient care uh, as far as my background is concerned uh, my name is dhawal sehija and i'm subject matter expert and independent researcher in augmented reality and mixed reality for uh, various industry domains including healthcare manufacturing and engineering uh, so as of now i am working as a solution manager in a local it company that is based out of uh, dallas texas usa uh, into various roles including business strategy technology consulting and digital innovation okay Uh, as far as uh, the background and the abstract of uh, this review article is concerned uh, so as of now uh, various medical device device manufacturing companies they are basically exploring ways as to how they can leverage immersive immersive technologies such as augmented reality and mixed reality to overall digitize the patient care improve the response time of the patient and how they can provide the support remot remotely specifically in this post pandemic era so so far what has been happening is that uh, immersive technology such as mixed reality was just used in space research and manufacturing automation and engineering and military and so forth uh, however uh, healthcare companies have learned from other domains and now they are experimenting various ways as to how they can integrate mixed reality headsets and glasses with medical devices to overall improve the patient care right so little background about what mixed reality headsets are so mixed reality headsets are they are basically kind of smart glasses that provide hands free experience along with uh, voice enablement right so you might have heard about google glasses or you might have used various kind of uh, uh, vr headsets so mixed reality headsets are on similar line similar line uh, they basically provide hands free experience as well as voice enablement Uh, so surgeons and physicians and nurses and telemedicine professionals can use it in various kind of uh, pre surgical procedures and remote consultations and related tasks okay. okay as far as the objective and purpose of this study is concerned so basically one of the primary purpose is to understand what is the current state of adoption of this kind of tools and technologies within healthcare domain secondly Uh, we know that uh, this tools and technology have enormous uh, potential but still it is not been used so ideas to understand what are the limitations that are hindering adoption of these tools 
third thing uh, ideas to figure out as to what more can be done so that uh, medical device manufacturers can integrate uh, this kind of headsets uh, with medical devices uh, to overall improve the patient care and also to overall improve the adoption of these tools among medical professionals so uh, let me talk about the met methodology so as far as the methodology of this uh, critical review is concerned overall uh, we had identified nearly 170 plus papers and articles and ted talks out of which uh, we figured out that nearly 140 were uh, not relevant or they did not match the inclusion criteria or they were in a non english language so those were those were excluded and nearly 30 publications were shortlisted for an for an integrative review uh, apart from that, uh, uh, there was secondary data also collected from various other research papers. And based on that, uh, content analysis and qualitative synthesis of articles was done. Furthermore, uh, we also did uh, uh, get a kind of secondary opinion from uh, various medical professionals via questionnaires and via feedback, just to make sure uh, that our study is heading in the right direction. Okay, so uh, quick insights about uh, the literature review. So as of now, if you look at uh, various kind of medical reality headsets and various kind of augmented reality headsets, so they are broadly used in this uh, five to six areas, right? So as of now, they are used in remote consultation in case of elderly care because, because elders are like senior citizens and also they are patients that are physically challenged. So they do not have capability to travel and commute uh, all the way to clinics, uh, clinics and hospitals. So in such scenario of remote consultations, these tools are used. Furthermore, uh, it has also been experimented that th this device has been used in pre-operative planning. Pre-operative planning meaning uh, the stage of the planning that happens before the surgery, such as performing various kind of medical tests, uh, preparing the operating room for surgery, and also identifying various areas of surgical incision. Furthermore, uh, in specifically in the post-pandemic uh, era, what has happened is that uh, many of the staff members and medical professionals are using such kind of devices because they provide a hands-free experience. So it provides lots of safety in terms of contagious diseases uh, such as Corona. Then uh, medical professionals are also able to do 3D annotations uh, in, while they are doing diagnostics of patients. Generally, that is something that they might have to do, take notes or take the help of nurse to take down notes, but that is something that they can do it in 3D annotation format. As far as the medical visualization is concerned, so as of now, uh, medical professionals, they have to fetch data from different kind of health records, uh, systems from different kind of digital X-ray systems and so on. But uh, with the help of this uh, devices such as HoloLens, they can basically get a kind of a universal dashboard or a universal view of the entire situation and the overall health and the medical history of the patient. Other interesting area where uh, these devices have been used is in terms of paramedics, because uh, paramedics, uh, they have to deliver these tools in case of emergency cares, such as accidents or such as sports in injury. So in this case, uh, paramedics, they are generally on the field and uh, uh, they have to pretty much be mobile and be portable and be ready to provide support. They cannot like carry the entire clinic and so forth. So in this case, uh, paramedics can remotely uh, use, uh, they, can, they can wear a headset and then they can remotely connect from a headset by doing a video call uh, to, a, to a doctor into the clinic and, and make him aware about the current state of the accident or the sports injury and can take a remote support. Okay. So based on the methodology following our, uh, uh, the key findings and key synthesis, uh, key, sorry, key analysis and uh, synthesis. Uh, so as of now, I think uh, overall a lot of, I will, I'll just uh, summarize this in the larger interest of the time. So overall, many of the medical professionals think, do think that uh, this kind of mixed reality devices can improve patient care, they can improve, they can support in better clinical decision making, they can also support in collaboration with other doctors and nurses, and uh, they can also support in providing a kind of virtual and simulated learning and uh, skill development. So one of the important things, one of the important points that I've mentioned in the bottom is that uh, nearly 45% of the study indicate that healthcare professionals are open to adopt this 
mixed reality tools however many of those professionals they find there are certain kind of technology limitations that are basically creating a barrier in further adoptions of this headsets so overall the idea is to find what those barriers are and how we can try to overcome those barriers so as far as those barriers are concerned broadly these are the three um, main barriers that we found out one of the barriers that we found out was in terms of data latency so many times telemedicine professionals that are uh, going into the field uh, they do wear these headsets and they try to access the data from healthcare record systems and other devices and so on but uh, they do face data latency issue sometimes the data latency issue is because of the network uh, sometimes it is because they are in a remote location uh, which is far off from the city and so on wherein they cannot they can access the data in real time and at times there are also issues in terms of computing capabilities of this devices so this is one of the areas that we need to overcome to drive the adoption second issue is pertaining to data privacy uh, many of the patients are obviously concerned that uh, uh, the healthcare records they have sensitive data such as their medical history their family history and uh, uh, also history pertaining to other aspects right other diseases and so on so that is something that they are concerned that it should not be exposed from uh, medical health systems into this smart glasses so we need to figure out ways as to how we can overcome this data privacy issues third but not last but not the least is the content compatibility so uh, one of the very uh, easy example is of digital x rays so as of now if you know that radiologist they they produce digital x rays which are in decom file format now you cannot directly use this digital x rays into hololens or such kind of smart glass devices we have to now convert as of now we have to now manually convert the decom file uh, into a 3d model using 3d max or maya kind of software and once it is converted in into this 3d model then after that uh, we have to convert the 3d model into an hologram using 3 you using unity 3d so these are basically two steps uh, to make the digital x ray from 2d to 3d format and from 3d to an 3d hologram format so this basically takes lot lots of effort lots of tedious time energy energy is wasted to make a, a, a simple x ray compatible with hololens so if we can figure out ways as to how we can make this overcome this content compatibility issue or automate this then it can definitely drive adoption furthermore many of the medical professionals that are belonging to the previous generation they are used to using desktops they are used to using tablets obviously uh, they are not very familiar with this kind of mixed reality headsets so we need to provide them system at training as to how they can gradually transmit from desktop or mobile to this headsets and then they can adopt it other aspect is in terms of portability so as of now if you look at any any kind of mixed reality or any kind of augmented reality headset it is pretty heavy like you cannot you cannot wear it for a long duration on your head if you do it then your head starts paining so we need to look at ways as to how we can make it more mobile how we can make it more portable by reducing the weight of the device uh, and making sure that overall computing is not compromised uh, the idea is that uh, once they become more portable then the adoption will be as high as any other kind of mobile device or any other kind of tablet now moving forward in the last section of the presentation are the outcomes and conclusions the outcomes and conclusion are pertaining to how we can drive the adoption like in the previous section we discussed about the challenges and the limitations and barriers so as of now we will talk about how we can what is the solutions or what kind of outcomes and conclusions we can provide to drive the adoption so one of the key areas is 5g enablement right so previously i talked about uh, the data latency issue so medical devices they are and, and the healthcare record system they are able to push the data uh, and also also the mixed reality headsets they are able to receive it but between the mixed reality headsets and the medical device in between there is a service layer so we call it web services in technical language so this web services needs to be they needs to be become scalable so that uh, they are able to transmit such kind of immersive content such as 3d holograms such as medical visualization such as digital digital x ray 
container unless we make sure that the entire ecosystem including the devices including the headsets and also the service level layer in between is enabled with 5g technology uh, such kind of immersive content cannot be transmitted into the real time for te telemedicine professionals into the field specifically uh, in kind of scenarios such as paramedics and so forth second aspect is the hipaa compliance so obviously there's a lot of private information or uh, uh, critical information or sensitive information that we are transmitting from medical device or ehr or emr uh, to this hololens kind of devices so we need to make sure that uh, the web services layer that we are designing in json or similar kind of technology uh, has to be compatible with hipaa so until unless we make it compatible with hipaa uh, no patient would be ready to share uh or allow such kind of data transmit between the devices and neither any kind of even any kind of uh, healthcare professional would be ready to adopt it until unless hipaa compliance is been implemented across the entire ecosystem last but not the least is uh, automating the middleware layer so as of now as i stated there is two step procedure or at times maybe three steps are to be taken to convert a digital file from like a 2d x-ray file from 2d to 3d and then from 3d to hologram so we can basically develop a middleware so there are there are there are basically dot net services that are available so we can use such kind of dot net services to design a middleware that can basically automate content conversion process instead of two steps it would just need one step and that too without any manual intervention so if in case we are able to if in case we design such kind of middleware that can automate uh, uh, the content conversion process whether it is x ray whether it is any kind of medical record or whether it is any kind of other content that you can think about related to body analogy so uh, that that can basically empower the medical professionals into the field to access the data in real time yeah. Right. So yeah, so this was this was uh, uh, the overall key outcomes and, and conclusions. Any any questions you may have or uh, any specific queries you may have pertaining to this critical review, so feel free to ask. thank you mr saija uh, so in review you know the main concern is like uh, data collection that we all know so you mentioned this uh, you collected data from uh, some research papers and uh, and secondary uh, for uh, conducting the interviews right yeah 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 so yeah. Uh, so before interview you must have uh, formulated the questionnaire also right exactly exactly so so can you let me know what type of questions you have prepared for this so basically yes absolutely so basically questionnaires were qualitative in nature right because uh, because it is it is it is not you know like quantified so questionnaires were basically qualitative in nature so one of one of the few examples of the questions are that uh, firstly we wanted to understand what kind of devices or what kind of interface currently the medical professionals are using second kind of question was that whether or not they have any past experience uh, with using such kind of uh, uh, mixed reality or augmented reality kind of headsets other thing is that if in case that they have used that set then how their experience is or or uh, or what is what is causing hindrance in adoption of uh, this kind of devices uh, what what are the concerns that they are facing so some of them they stated that uh, they were facing cons uh, concerns in terms of let's say computing right because they are transmitting immersive content from medical device such as like uh, such as like 3d models of body analog anatomy into those devices so because of such immersive content uh, it it ends up occupying lot of computing in that sets so headsets get overheated and because of that mm -hmm. uh, they are not able to use that set for longer duration so such kind of limitations that they were facing or such kind of barriers that they had uh, in terms of adopting or using these devices those are the aspects that were tried to identify and then uh, they are also given options that uh, if in case uh, 
these are various kind of solutions or these are various kind of approach that we propose if are if we are able to resolve it with this kind of approaches or solutions that is stated then would they be willing to use it and and so forth yeah okay so that is what uh, uh, you got out of the research papers and uh, uh, yeah. interviews so now uh, just the question is based on your practicality what is your personal opinion about uh, uh, the mixed reality integration in practical based on your experience yeah definitely i mean uh, what what is happening is that first thing is that uh, at a very high level is that this tools and technologies they are used as of now they are been used at an experimental level but uh, the post pandemic era has basically driven the adoption of it specifically in scenario which doctors they don't want to get hold of contagious disease or uh, they are dealing with multiple patients and they have to provide supports to patients from a remote location and so forth so in such scenarios both patients as well as doctors and the professionals they have become more and more technology aware so before the pandemic they had some concerns or they were not open to adopt but post uh, post pandemic scenario they they have become pretty open Uh, to adopt such kind of uh, tools yeah okay so honest opinion thank you very much okay yeah. okay all right thanks thanks uh, thanks for asking that question and thanks again to all uh, juries all organizers and all co sponsors for providing me an opportunity to present us here is a not for the paper presentation session number 1 all the participants have 15 days more time till 5th december 2021 for any modification updates in your paper for the publication and publication process will start after all selected papers converted as per the standard publication format as per general guidelines participants presenters will receive e certificate till 26 november hard copy of certificate and proceedings book after 10th december and tentative date for the online publication 10th december